what I normally do is we just go through the panel, introduce yourself, and then we just put it out to questions to the audience, and then we normally have a massive argy-bargy, and that's the kind of panel session we normally have. So hi there, Michael Rolfe, uh, Director at Anthemus Group. Um, for those of you not familiar with Anthemus, we are uh, an investor solely in the financial services space, um, big believer in disruptive, innovative technology being deployed for the, I guess, the betterment of our industry. Um, we have a bit of a unique model, we're not uh, traditional VC. Uh, we also have an advisory component to our business, both Anthemus Edge and FT Advisors, so we do strategic and transaction advisory services, and we're able to deploy that, uh, that knowledge that we have in our advisory business uh, to the benefit of our portfolio companies as well. Um, I'm still Alex and from Optimus. <laughs> <coughs> Uh, my name's Ian Dowson. My day job is the management of disposals um, uh, from a fairly early, early stage out, from like a couple of years before a company's going to be disposed of, predominantly PLCs. I was selling a newspaper business. Everybody would come through the door and say, isn't the internet going to close you down? Very good question. I then got into digital media, and from digital media, it led into fintech. Thank you. Simon Dixon, CEO of Bank to the Future. And Nigel Walker from the Technology Strategy Board. Okay, so who's got a question for the panel? Okay, Emma. Into the mic, please. Uh, so if we look at the alternative finance space, you can see a lot of financial innovation islands out there. FinTech is the major one. You have a social finance um, innovation Island, you have health, you have innovation in environment finance, so you have a lot of different type of areas that are right now trying to come up with some new solutions to the existing uh, traditional banking system. So how do you think that uh, this space can be aggregated? How do you think that tech fin can learn something from social finance or from environmental finance? Okay, so um, You're very brave. Okay, <laughs> it's pretty wide, right? So I will try and and sort of think about. So I the way that I and I think we uh, Anthemus sort of view financial services at the moment in terms of an industry point of view is we're not in too much of a different space to where perhaps the utilities companies used were 20 years ago and where uh, telecoms market was about 20 years ago, where you had some major uh, corporations, perhaps you know publicly or privately owned that through, um, you know, through distribution of technology and certain regulatory changes uh, fact effectively opened up the markets. And I think we're seeing a similar thing happening in financial services now where it's more, you're more able from an entrepreneurial point of view to effectively build a business in a niche on top of an existing infrastructure. So what that really means is actually it's not necessarily as important what space within, that, within the sector that you're looking at the, the bottom line is the opportunity now exists, whereas you know, 10, 15 years ago, fundamentally it was very different. And technology, you know, as we all know, has been a huge enabler of that. And so really when we're talking about things like social finance, all that's enabled it is technology. So simply just didn't exist previously, other than perhaps you know, knocking, on, uh, knocking your neighbor's door or your parent's door and asking them for uh, some money or going around to friends with cap in hand. You know, it was very personal in that sense, but as now, you know, you're able to reach a far bigger audience and things like Kickstarter and Zopa that are out there mean that you can actually go out and, and find uh, a lot more funding for, um, you know, for the projects or the, uh, the business you're working on. So it's a fairly wide, <laughs> wide answer, but hopefully there's something in that that opens up the panel a little bit as well. Um, I think the, the challenge with um, disruptive finance and fintech at the moment and social finance and everything is that the banks are still pretty stingy with their API keys. Um, and once the, the banks um, get a little less protective over that, and it's not really a, a, a security thing, um, I think it's more of a protective thing. So you still have to be a company that's trading for a couple of years um, and turning over X amount of things and, and hitting a, a load of boxes until you'll be able to access um, proper uh, API access at the moment with the banks. So. Um, once that gets unleashed, um, if it gets unleashed, if they want to unleash it, um, you'll see some, you'll see much more rapid uh, disruption as well. I think. 
I think the other aspect is on the where innovative businesses can be focused on is towards the, the customer base. Uh, and it's something in financial services that is, uh, traditionally the glass in the space have not necessarily looked after their customers particularly well. Um, there's also a lot of legacy systems that exist within those organizations. So there's opportunities around the edges um, which provides great opportunity for entrepreneurs uh, to build and the fact you can now do it relatively cheaply. Um, but it comes back to you know some of the aspects of how can you interlink with them, whether it be um, some of the payments models, some of the, uh, the plumbing for the payments models, should I put it that way? Um, I'd agree with the cost equations has now changed out of sight. Previously, if you wanted to set up a bank, you would need billions to build your computer systems. Now you need five or ten people in an office and you can build a fully functioning bank. So cost ratios have changed significantly. Regulatory uh, d uh, d uh, d approval, I think that's going to change a lot because the government now gets it that having four major banks all related to uh, uh, derivative trading arms is a s big systemic risk and they don't want to bail them out again. And then thirdly, you've got the background of retail and uh, d uh, the United Kingdom is the world's largest retail enabled internet uh, d uh, d uh, d uh, economy. And the customers buy from Amazon the products. They want to buy financial services from the internet. I'd like to add on those two points, actually. The, the, the main change I think you're going to see is that people um, don't want a relationship with their bank anymore. Um, so you're seeing Facebook come along, you're seeing uh, Amazon come along, you're seeing Google come along. Um, really, they're not really doing anything disruptive. All they're doing is building on top of banks and the existing infrastructure. PayPal wasn't, you know, it's just really building on top of the same old systems, 30-year-old systems uh, that need massive updating. But what I think has changed is that uh, people want a relationship with Facebook, they want a relationship with Google, they want a relationship with Amazon. So I think these uh, these companies are going to take the forward, the, the forefront, the client relationship, and the banks are still going to have the the monopolistic infrastructure um, that they're that they're not letting go of. Um, so we're going to see them a lot more in the background um, in the relationship, which has consequences, which will be interesting to watch. So in recent years, we've seen a lot of fintech startups specializing in particular areas of finance, whether it's like crowdfunding or, you know, peer-to-peer -peer loans or, uh, or, you know, what have you. Um, but the, it's all quite a fragmentary landscape at the moment for businesses and consumers. Do you think that we're going to see um, some consolidation as the sort of market matures? Do I have an opinion on that? Uh, no, I don't. Um, <laughs> I, I think because there's so much to do. Um, one can look at um, consumer versus business uh, finance, for example. The, the, there's, there are huge opportunities in both of those areas for innovation and development. Now, you know, Michael's mentioned Fedor Bank, who have a, a very innovative way of doing things. Um, there, was, there was talk earlier about how innovators can get inside the, the large banking organizations to address their legacy systems with them. Um, I think that there's an, there are opportunities for a lot of smaller organizations who have innovative ideas to get inside the established institutions in order to help them to address their problems in areas that might be obvious and um, sexy, such as um, you know, business, uh, retail banking, um, and, and even someone as, uh, as, as tech unsavvy as, as, as I can think about um, you know, mobile applications, using my smartphone to, um, to, to access my bank account to transfer money. Um, but what interests me are, are the opportunities in the boring, unsexy, untalked about stuff. Who's addressing the issues around corporate actions for institutional fund managers and custodian banks? God, that's boring. But it's absolutely ripe for, okay, sorry, sorry you've written 4,000 lines of code about it. You must know how interesting it is. Um, there are opportunities. <laughs> <laughs>
there are opportunities. There, there are opportunities there to help the banks take cost out of the system. That helps consumers to get a better return on the pension funds that they have or the mutual funds that they're invested in, provided the banks just don't just you know, take the margin and, and sit on it, which they might be tempted to do, who knows. Um, it's areas like that that I think are going to be the, the immediately interesting areas in financial technology. Um, and I think there's huge scope for that. And particularly in London, I think there's huge scope for that, just as there was in, uh, or there is in New York. Um, they're the two, the world's two leading international global financial centers. All the big institutions are based here in the city. Um, we're here in the city. I spend a lot of time working with developers and people from the digital and creative worlds in Tech City around Old Street. It's two tube stops away, and they don't talk enough about what they can do to this enormous market that's here in the city of London and Canary Wharf, which is nearly in the city of London. Sorry. So the obvious places for, um, I guess, you know, disruptive thought or innovation are always going to be sort of more consumer-led to start with because most of us uh, along the way as entrepreneurs are disgruntled with some sort of service. So that tends to be this sort of the idea that sparks the passion. Um, I think to your point, you know, I'm, I haven't got a capital markets background, but I know a few people who will, will say that maybe for them it's, it's quite interesting. So I maybe disagree. Some people will find it interesting in that sense. Um, but actually structurally, the opportunity to make changes are so different in terms of complexity, uh, investment, and actually, actually, you know, in terms of then sort of winning customers, you know, it's a probably more traditional B2B sale, which means it's lengthy. Um, I think there are just tougher uh, barriers of entry that you need to break down. And I think that really goes to the point, uh, probably supports your point a little bit. I think it will, will get there. Things like LIBOR obviously help. Um, it helps identify that technology is something that does need to, to creep further into sort of the core structures of our financial institutions. Um, whether that will be somebody that uh, was once involved in actually uh, you know, submitting a rate and saying, well, actually, I had a really good idea. I sent it into the bank 10 years ago. They turned me down, but you know, perhaps now is the moment to do something about it. You know, perhaps we'll start seeing some of that. And I think what we'll probably also encourage is a bit more challenge-led inno um, innovation. So the likes of the banks actually participating and actually setting some of these challenges to get uh, the collective brain power of entrepreneurs who are self-motivated and haven't got the uh, political... Uh, captivity that exists in large corporations it's not knocking them that's one of the you know realities that that sort of exist in a large corporation uh, to maybe come up with some innovative solutions yeah, I think the other thing we've got to remember is fintechs are quite a large space I mean you're you're talking about a whole vast remit of you know specific verticals within it uh, if you just took the um, the peer-to-peer -peer or the crowd lending um, area you can say th that is originated as a result of the banks not lending to small business. Um, you know, well, 92% of business loans were made by you know, the big four. They stop lending. Somebody's going to step into that um, area. It's why we're seeing a rising, you know, corporate bonds being issued, and by quite small companies as well. Um, it's it's all of the same. Area. Will there be consolidation at some point in time? Absolutely there will be, and there will be people who actually rise to the top in that area. Oh, okay, so uh, so uh, uh, what would be the difference between uh, creating an open source alliance uh, for to make uh, new uh, uh, apps and solutions, or um, or to crowd uh, fund the crowdsource the 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 funding. What would be the what would be the pros and cons with an alliance like that compared to trying to that would normally get uh, membership fees uh, compared to uh, using the new tool crowd funding or crowdsourced funding. I think you've got both movements going on at the same time. If you look at Open Gamma, which is the first real financial services open source system, which has got Sirius, and that's aiming to get into the back offices and analytics within financial services companies. And the crowdfunding, again, is starting to become a movement to, um, uh, and go viral. Uh, so you have the same characteristics in both open source systems and in terms of crowdfunding. 
the capacity to go viral? I think it's about um, what the what the needs of the of the businesses or the people involved are. So um, a, another example of uh, perhaps not open source but open access is in the insurance industry, um, where I, I'm aware that there, there's a project called Oasis, which is about an open access catastrophe model for reinsurers and and the complex insurers in the London market. And the need there is not so much around cash as around data and the ability to analyze really, really complex data sets in order to help the insurance industry to assess um, catastrophe risk. From a financing point of view, you know, the open, uh, open access around crowdfunding is, is about people recognizing that they need so different sources of funds, and, and that's been talked about already, so I won't repeat it. Why do you think that um, in terms of equity investing, crowdfunding, but investing especially, there is still so much focus on startups rather than looking also at other asset classes such as real estate, public equities, even public corporate debt as a, like a, a debt category? Why do you think is still the case that innovation is mainly focusing on the, that, like the startup category rather than trying to expand further? Um, I'm not sure that crowd investing is focusing on startups. I know that Cedars focus on pre-revenue startups, um, but most of the successful crowd investments have all been from established businesses, um, and we're, you know, we're, we're certainly f we're, we certainly have no bias towards startup. In fact, um, we'd much rather if so if a startup comes to us, a pure startup, um, we'd ask them to make a bit more progress before they um, crowd invest with us. Because really, we, we focus on um, helping people get investment ready, the same thing they would pitch to an angel um, if they're going to pitch to the crowd. We think that it's really important that they've really thought through um, everything there. So I'm, I'm not sure if there is a bias um, towards startup. Um, and I, I think the startups will find it more challenging to, to raise crowd investment finance over established businesses which have existing database existing fans and existing customers uh, who can they pull who can pull together in order to become their investors from their joint venture partners their suppliers um, and uh, everything around that what about innovating in the way that a stock like Microsoft is traded like real public equity um, changing the way that is approached by the public. Okay, so will will companies that traditionally um, yeah. went public public will yeah, they, they are really will they public and trading? Future? I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think it's something that's quite interesting actually because you, if if we look at the stock markets, what's that supposed to provide us to? And now it happens to be that we all contribute to, you know, in various means, whether it be you know pensions and such like, where those managers go off and make investments on our behalf. Um, actually, where are the areas you have the most vibrant stock markets tend to be where the private investor gets involved. Um, one of the big issues for actually UK economy as we go through funding cycles and building big businesses um, is where are the sources of funds? And if you have a public market where there's excitement of the private investor, and I, you know, I, I can remember back to the privatizations. You know, if you wanted to invest in British gas, you could only invest 800 quid. Um, that was because the demand from the private investor base. So if you create the demand and interest from private investors, you're going to have a vibrant marketplace where there's access for, ca uh, for uh, companies to go and get capital. And that can only be a good thing. Um, more question for the VCs. Um, do you see corporate venture teams as competition? Um, they're doing equity funding and JVs, that sort of thing. And in the case of um, a B2B fintech company um, who are wanting to go down that route of funding, um, do you think that that implicit industry validation is more attractive than going down the traditional VC route of funding? Um, are they competition? Yes. Are they partners? Yes. Um, are they another uh, a source for entrepreneurs? Yes. Are they welcome into the space? Absolutely. Um, 
there's a whole myriad of different corporate ventures and the way in which they operate. Uh, and I think what's important is, you know, one of, one of the issues that we often have is who is, your, who is the co-investor and are your interests actually aligned? Um, corporate interests are often not aligned with VC. Um, there are certain corporate venturing outfits that have been set up which are standalone units, they have to make a financial award. There are others that are set up with regards to, you know, how is this going to benefit corporate in the future? And is this, our, you know, frankly, a cheap way in? And things like rights of first refusal can mean that those interests are not aligned. So in the same way, I'd say to an entrepreneur, always pick your partner, not only on cash that they bring to the table, but what else they bring to the table. I would apply exactly the same metrics with regards to corporate. The one significant difference is a big change at the top means that a new FD comes in who can say, actually, why on earth are we doing that tiny little operation because we're investing in small little business and shut it down overnight? And that can be a problem for uh, one, the entrepreneur and also a co-investor. Yeah, I think just to build on that, so from an entrepreneurial start point of view, it depends on what stage you're at and really what your strategy is. You know, maybe you know, that corporate partner is going to be your exit route and it makes sense uh, strategically and logically that you create a relationship that builds over time and so you go in with your eyes wide open. But equally, um, I think to, to Alex's point, you know, there are changes of leadership in corporates that mean that one day you are the, uh, you know, the darling of uh, um, a corporate's innovation um, you know, policy and the next day somebody comes in, they don't really understand it, their job is to control costs, so they shut down funding and, you know, a recent example of that is Obopay and, uh, you know, Nokia. So, um, you know, perhaps the next uh, example of that may be monetize and Visa. So th I think there are a number of examples out there where it becomes public knowledge where it's gone pro perhaps really badly. What doesn't necessarily come to the forefront of the, uh, the times when it's gone really well because it just ends up that you know they've been acquired, uh, they, you know, a corporate venture will acquire the, out, the asset outright over time, but perhaps have had a longer involvement that just wasn't so uh, well known about. So I think uh, you know, for me, from uh, our point of view, I I will look at a corporate venture partner as anybody else. I don't think there is such a thing as competition from a, uh, an investor's point of view if you are just solely focused on you know what it is you do well. And uh, again, going in as a, you know, if you are a co-investor with your eyes wide open as to whether or not you want to be in a situation where you see a corporate partner with perhaps a bit of undue influence uh, because they've put the money in, but they're not putting any brains in. And, and really what you want is a corporate partner that's going to enable you to grow and grow rapidly. That's probably the primary reason why they become attractive because you look at it from scalability as opposed to cash. Because if you want cash and you've got a great model, you shouldn't be short of finding opportunities to raise that from uh, other sources. And I'd go back to, to what Alex was saying earlier about what does the investor bring to the entrepreneur. And the thing that corporate venturers can very often bring is, is access to markets, access to a potential customer base, whether that's actually in terms of sales or, or, or understanding of, of the needs of a customer base. And that can really help um, an entrepreneur in, in growing a business. There's the limitation potentially, though, that that gets to a point at which um, the market includes the competitors of that corporate investor, and then you've got a difficult conversation to have. So it's it's absolutely, as Michael says, it's about having your eyes wide open. As Alex says, it's about understanding what they bring. Um, so th at that point, it's less about the money and more about the relationship. Uh, yeah, so what, what, what I want to do, if um, I'd want to get really crystal clear in a contract what they're actually going to do, um, if they're going to give you distribution, um, then make sure that's real crystal clear of what they're actually going to bring to the table. So uh, you may have seen it, but when we launched, we got the backing of Sir Richard Branson, um, and it was very clear um, what he was going to, you know, what was he going to do? Was he going to do a press release and this type of stuff? So um, just make sure you get it crystal clear what the, what the relationship actually is, because it it may seem that it's uh, one thing, but they may not be willing to give you the distribution or whatever it is. So get that clear. Yeah, I think the problem comes when you want to exit the business. You always get the best price from your competitor. And if you're a corporate, you're tempted to take the price 
but then you think that business which we spent five years developing is now going to go to our biggest competitor and it just creates absolute chaos in all the relationships between the investors. It becomes very difficult to get a resolution. I think it's a danger we paint too gloomy a picture about corporate venturing. I think we should recognize they bring capital to the space, um, they're very welcome, and it's, it's a part of just making sure that you look at all elements of a transaction and deal. And remember, if they're investors, they're gonna be sat beside you for some time. Okay, thanks guys. Uh, I think that's, that's all we have time for right now. Cheers. <laughs>